if you and I have ever had a conversation, I would imagine that we have probably talked about my love of history. Not only do I have a love of history, I also have a great love for listening to the sermons of the past. Now, I didn't go to preaching school, but I often say that my instructors in my preaching school were preachers that I listen to on a daily basis. I try to listen to at least one sermon a day, perhaps sometimes two sermons a day. And I don't just listen to sermons that have been recently preached. I oftentimes listen to sermons that have been preached long, long ago. Sermons by Brother Marshall Keeble, Brother Wendell Winkler, Brother M.B. Hardiman. In fact, even at my house, on my desk, I have a two-volume set of the Tabernacle Sermons that were preached by Brother M.B. Hardiman in the year of 1922. And I read through those very often. You know, here's a great lesson about the sermons of the past. They are still relevant today. The lessons that were preached, say, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, perhaps even 100 years ago, those lessons are still applicable to us today as Christians. And in the month of March, we're going to begin a new sermon series, and that series is going to be called Great sermons of the past. And we are going to dive into sermons that were preached many years ago, but sermons that are still relevant to our lives today as New Testament Christians. And this morning, we're going to begin with a sermon that was preached by Brother M.B. Hardiman in the year of 1922 that was titled, The Savior's Invitation. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we are so thankful that you have blessed us with an opportunity to gather together as your people and worship you in spirit and in truth. We're thankful, Lord, that you have blessed us with the ability to be able to learn from your word, to make application in our lives as New Testament Christians so that we can deepen our relationship with you. We recognize, Lord, the key to our relationship with you is found within your inspired word. And help us, Lord, each and every single day to study, to grow, and to deepen our relationship that we share with you through Christ Jesus. We pray that your blessing will be upon our time together this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The story is told of Brother M.B. Hardiman. Not only was he a very powerful gospel preacher, he was also a collector of champion horses. In fact, he owned a horse that was named Made of Cotton. And one day, he decided that he was going to go for a ride on this horse named Made of Cotton. And he rode down to the old stock barn that was south of what was then known as Freed Hardeman College. And outside of that old stock barn, there were some old men who were sitting outside of that barn. They saw Brother Hardeman ride up on Made of Cotton. And they asked him the question, they said, would you take $10,000 for that horse? Brother Hardeman said, I've turned down. $30,000 for that horse. Now those men, they were absolutely amazed. And so they asked the question, well, why didn't you sell her? Brother Hardiman said, I can't ride $30,000. He was a faithful gospel preacher for over 60 years. He was a debater. He was also a professor and a teacher of the Word of God. You know, over 20,000 people sat at his feet and learned the Word of God. The sermon that we are going to dive into tonight, or this morning rather, is a sermon that was preached by him in the year of 1922 in the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee, where he held a gospel meeting from March 28th of 1922 to April 16th of 1922. And as a result of of his very powerful preaching of the Word of God, it led to many lives being changed. There were many people who were searching for New Testament Christianity that left denominationalism to become New Testament Christians, and it led to a great growth in the Lord's church. And that title of that sermon was The Savior's Invitation. Now, we know that the Savior's Invitation is found in Matthew, the 11th chapter, beginning there in verse 28. And you can turn there with me in your Bibles. That is where we are going to begin our lesson this morning. Now, before we dive into the Savior's Invitation that we find within that particular set of scriptures, I want to provide you with some other passages of scripture that really set the stage, if you will, for the passage that we are going to read and the passage that we are going to study This morning. Now, 
I want to discuss with you the geography of the passage. About 70 miles north of the Dead Sea is another sea that we find within the Bible. This sea goes by three separate names. It is known as the Sea of Chinnereth. It is known as Lake Gennesaret, but it's also known as the Sea of Galilee. And on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, you will find four prominent cities. If you were to stand right in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and you were to look to the north, you would find the city of Bethsaida. You may remember that in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus addressed that city in his woe unto you sermon. If you were to look to the northwest, you would find the city of Chorazin. If you were to look to the west, you would find the city of Nazareth. That is the city where my Savior spent the early parts of his life. And if you were to look to the southwest, you would find the, the city of Capernaum. That's where my Savior lived in the latter half of his life, according to the Apostle Matthew in Matthew chapter 9, at verse 1. Now, the city of Nazareth, it carried a little bit of a stigma, did it not? Do you remember what Nathanael asked in John chapter 1 and verse 46 when he found out that Jesus was from the city of Nazareth? He posed the question and said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? My Savior had humble beginnings. But you know, it's that geography that helps us to set the stage for the passage that we are going to read this morning. And I would invite you to begin reading with me in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 11. We're going to read through verse 23, and then we're going to jump down, and we're going to read verses 28 through 30 of that very same chapter. Beginning in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 20, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. And so this is what our Savior said. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who were exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. On down to verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If there's a lesson in that text for us today, that lesson is to every man and to every woman that has ever lived. And that lesson is simply this. All men and all women are accountable unto God. But this is important. Not only are we accountable unto God, we are accountable for what we know and we are accountable for what we can learn. You and I are accountable unto God. We are accountable for what we learn as we gather together with the saints of God this morning and worship God in spirit and in truth. We are accountable for having the right mindset and for worshiping God in the manner in which God has commanded us to worship Him. And you know, this is made abundantly clear by the fact that the cities where Jesus did his mightiest works and his mightiest deeds were the cities that rejected the invitation that had been offered by the Son of God. Jesus says, you're accountable. I have done my mightiest works and my mightiest deeds in these cities, and yet you still reject me. You are accountable. The very presence of this invitation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, beginning there in verse 28, is proof of the divinity of Christ and the deity of Christ. It is proof that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus was the greatest preacher to ever walk upon the face of the earth. And do you know why? Because he knew the hearts 
of the men and the women that he preached to. There has never been another king. There has never been another prophet. There has never been another priest. There has never been another poet. There has never been another preacher. There has never been another man on the face of the earth who would even dare to offer such an invitation and say to a group of people, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I could take my Bible and I could go downtown Paintsville and I could stand on the street corner of Main Street and College Street and I could hold this Bible up in the air and I could say, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And do you know how people would respond to that? They would probably look at me like I'm crazy, but then they would start asking me questions. Well, who are you to be able to offer such an invitation? What authority do you have to be able to fulfill the invitation that you offer? Where did you come from? And what's the difference between a man offering this invitation and God offering this invitation? It's simple. God is the only one that has the authority and the power to fulfill the invitation that he has offered. You know, when Jesus made this statement, Jesus had already stood on the stormy banks of the Jordan and been recognized as the Son of God. When Jesus made this invitation... He had already been fasted for 40 days, led out into the wilderness by the Spirit, stood face to face with the enemy of God, been tempted in all points as we are, yet he remained without sin and became our high priest. Jesus offered this invitation because Jesus had the power and Jesus had the authority to fulfill it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And then he would proceed to give the great commission. Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. And he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he who believeth not shall be condemned. Jesus could fulfill the invitation that he offered because of his power and his authority. But this is the question that we need to explore in our lesson this morning. And that question is simply, who is the Savior's invitation extended unto? Answer number one. The Savior's invitation is extended unto those who... Have left. Now, brethren, if we rub our brains together here, if we put our two cents together, I think that we can come up with a common sense answer to this question. If someone is inviting others to come unto them, then what does that imply in the question? That implies that they are not near them. That implies that they have left them. That implies that they are away from them. You would not say to somebody, come unto me, who you are hand in hand with, who you are heart to heart with, who you are shoulder to shoulder with, who you are arm in arm with. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he is extending that invitation to those who have left. Thus the Savior says, Come unto me. But the question that we have to pose as a result of that basic biblical fact is this. How did we go away from God? Now you could answer this, ask this question to any number person in the religious world today. And I would imagine that you would get many different answers. But there are those in the religious world today who would say that we are born away from God. Or that we are born away from Christ. Hence the doctrine of depravity or the miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit. And it states this. That man is conceived and that man is born into sin. But I want to tell you this morning, not to believe a single syllable of that statement. There is not a person on the top side of God's green earth that could turn to the Bible 
and find such a statement. In fact, one could find statements that completely show the error in that doctrine. And I know what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 51 in verse 5. Let's explore what he said. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. But let's think about this statement for just a moment. You got to take into context the fact that David in Psalm 51 is talking about his sin as an adult. In fact, he says, wash me, Lord, cleanse me of my iniquities. And then he goes on and he makes this statement. Now, does this statement of David imply that every child who is born has a heart that is as black as midnight? I think not. And that is a simple assertion based upon what we find in the Bible about sin. What must we do in order to be a sinner? We must sin. But what is sin? Sin is breaking the law of God. John wrote in 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 4, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness because lawlessness is sin. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see any precious babies who can barely walk, who may not even be able to talk, going around and committing lawlessness in the eyes of God and breaking the law of God. But then you also take into account what the Lord said in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. He said, the soul that sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. Now notice this, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Now God, what are you saying in this verse? What are you trying to get across to us? It's very simple. He says that the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. If you choose to live a life of righteousness, it's not because somebody else made that decision for you. It's not because the Spirit made that decision for you. If you choose to live a life of righteousness, it's because you made that decision. If you choose to live a life of wickedness, it's not because sin made you live wickedly. It's because you chose to live wickedly. God is saying you are accountable for the decisions that you make in this life. And there is no excuse when you stand on the day of judgment and you say, But God, my dad committed that same sin. But Lord, my mother committed that same sin. Did the fact that Isaac committed the same sin as Abraham make that sin any less sinful? God says if you choose righteous, you're going to live righteously. If you choose to live wickedly, you will live wicked lives. But let's dive deeper into this assertion If one is born into sin, if one inherits that sin, then which side does it come from? Does it come from the mother or does it come from the father? Well, if you say that it comes from the father, then Psalm 51 and verse 5 is the wrong verse for you because that has no hint of a mention of a father or the paternal side at all. He mentions his mother. But then if you say it comes from the mother, then that means, wait a second. Born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. Born as a man, yet he was king. That means that our Savior, born of a woman, had a streak of transgressions in him. Jesus says, Come unto me. The question is, how do we go away from Christ? Well, let's answer that with the Bible. Psalm 59, beginning there in verse 1, this is what the Lord says. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Now, wait a second. Go back. Your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Your sins have hidden his face from you. 
your iniquities have separated you from God. John chapter 9 and verse 31, God does not hear the prayers of those who are living in sin. Not a very popular fact in the Bible or in the world today, but it's a basic biblical truth. Every single person here stands accountable unto God because we choose the life that we live. It's not because we were born into sin. It's not because we inherited sin. It's because our own sins and our own transgressions and our own inquiries of our own fruition and of our own decision have separated us from God. Hence, Jesus says, come unto me. Who is the Savior's invitation extended unto? The Savior's invitation is extended unto those who must return. Now, I don't know about you, but this is also another basic common sense assertion. If a man has departed from God and God beckons and says, Come unto me, then that means that that man must return. To God. Now, I don't spend much time begging or pleading with God and with Christ to come into our midst and to revive and to convict because I think we understand the biblical view of this. God is always willing to save. Christ is always willing to receive. And the Spirit is always beckoning through the words of God. But the question is this. Who puts forth the effort? If I'm a man who has departed and Jesus says, come unto me, then who must put in the effort to come unto Christ? Is it God or is it man? Well, Paul answers that for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. He says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, wait a second. Who? We persuade persuade men well who is we Paul we as preachers of the gospel first Corinthians chapter 1 we as New Testament Christians we as those who teach and those who study and those who reveal the inspired word of God but we are well known to God and we trust that we are well known in your consciousness this is important If one is going to respond to the invitation of the Savior, it's not because of the decision of another person. It's not because, as the religious world would say, the testimony of someone else. It's not because the Spirit made you do it. It's because you chose to do it. And I'm reminded of what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 when he wrote this. He paints a picture for us, if you will, of those without Christ. He says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God the world. Paul, what did we not have as aliens of Israel? What did we not have as those who were without Christ? Well, we didn't have hope. And we did not have hope. And what a sad life it would be for someone to live without Christ, without hope, and without God. After all, it's our sin that removed us from Christ in the first place. It was Jesus who said in John chapter 8, beginning there in verse 21, I'm going away and you are going to seek me and will die in your sin. And if you die in your sin, where I go, you cannot come. So therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus says if you die in your sins because of a lack of faith or a lack of belief, it is not going to result in you going where Christ is going. But where is Christ going? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, know that I will come back and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Where are you going, Jesus? I'm going to heaven. And if you die in your sins, you cannot come where I am going. It is our sin that separates us and chains us to this old world. But it is Christ that sets us free. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8, verse 32. What is truth, Jesus? Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. John chapter 17 
and of verse 17. Brother M.B. Hardman would use this illustration oftentimes. I want you to imagine that there is a little small child. She's a beautiful girl. She has beautiful blonde curls, and she has on a wonderful dress. But then you also have a stake that is driven into the bosom of Mother Earth. And unfortunately, that child is chained to that stake. She's not able to move. She's not able to go anywhere. And imagine that you and I take this beautiful Barbie doll that has on this wonderful dress and these beautiful slippers, that if you were to lay her down, it would look like she had fallen asleep. And we were to take that Barbie doll around that girl who was chained to that stake, and we were to hold it in her face and say, I know you can't move, and I know you can't come unto me, but if you will, this Barbie doll will be yours. What would you say about that? Well, Zach, that's cruel. That's just hard-hearted why would you do something like that why would you not try to help her chain unchain herself from that stake there are people in this world who would have you to believe that there are not there are ears that cannot hear the gospel call that there are hearts that cannot understand God's redemptive message in his inspired word That there are eyes that cannot see the grace of God. That there are legs that cannot walk upon the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And what a travesty, an unholy, unholy thought that is to perpetuate such blasphemy. Because the fact of the matter is this. Jesus said, come unto me all ye who labor, not some of you who labor, Not the chosen who labor. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If there were those who were not able to come to Christ, Christ would have said this. I know you can't come to me, and I know you can't move. But if you will, I will give you rest. Jesus said in John chapter 5, beginning there in verse 39, You search through the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Now notice this language. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Jesus doesn't say you, you cannot come to me that you may have life. Jesus says you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Brethren, if a man stands lost on the day of judgment, It's because he chose to be lost. There will be many in that day who will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not prophesied and done many good works in your name? And I will say unto them, depart from me. Ye who practice lawlessness. What is lawlessness? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, lawlessness is sin. And what is sin? Sin is breaking the law of God. And if there is someone who stands on the day of judgment because he is lost as a result of his lawlessness, it's because he chose to live a life of lawlessness. Number three, who is the Savior's invitation extended unto? The Savior's invitation is extended unto those who will benefit from the reward. Now, sincerely think about this question here. Can you imagine the holy, spotless Lamb of God offering a suffering and sinful humanity an invitation to come unto Him if there were those who were not able to come unto Him? Can you imagine the holy, spotless Lamb of God offering a suffering and sinful humanity an invitation to come unto me if he was not willing and able to offer them rest? Jesus offers this invitation because it's for our good and it's for our profit. And the question that is implied from the text, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. The question implied from the text is this. Are you heavy laden? Are you weary? Have you burdens? If so, the answer is given by the Christ. Come to me and I will give you rest from all those things. Now when you strip this statement down to the nuts and bolts. When you take this invitation of Christ. And you put it in its simplest form. Jesus is talking about the final rest that waits for those who are the people of God. The final rest that waits for those who die in the Lord. And for just a moment I want you to read with me about that beautiful rest. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, the Hebrews writer says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. There are two things that we learn about the rest of God from this particular text. The first thing is this. The rest is compared to the Sabbath. That holy day of rest that had been sanctified by God. God created the heavens and the earth in six days. He rested on the seventh. He sanctified it and made it the Sabbath under the law of Moses and it is compared to that holy day of rest but number two and I don't want you to miss this the Hebrews writer says let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest now if somebody tells me let us therefore be diligent to enter into that room that means that I must choose to go into that room because I have a great urgency to want to enter into that room. Jesus says, come unto me. The Hebrews writer says, you must be diligent to enter into that rest. Why? Lest anyone fall. But you can't fall away from grace. One cannot fall once he has become a New Testament Christian. Lest anyone fall. To the same example of disobedience. The effort is on our part to enter into that rest that has been prepared for us from the foundations of the world. The rest that God created with his own hands. Not a house made with hands, but a house made with God's hands. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. The peace that Paul is talking about is a peace that can be yours. It's a peace that can be yours if you are diligent to enter into the rest that has been prepared for those who are the children of God. That peace can be yours if you're willing to accept. The invitation that the Savior has offered unto you and extended unto you. And in my mind, I can only imagine the rest that awaits those who have faithfully preached the gospel of Christ. Romans chapter 10 says, blessed are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. A rest for those who have stood upon and lived by the words of truth. A rest for those who did not shun from preaching the whole counsel of God, but ministered to the children of God by preaching the truth. I could only imagine the rest that awaits the elder of the church that ruled well. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. Let the elders who rule well among you be worthy of double honor. 1 Peter chapter 5. And when the chief shepherd appears, he shall give unto them, those under shepherds, those elders in the Lord's church, a great reward. A rest that awaits the weary soul from the troubles and toils of watching for the souls of others. And I can only imagine the rest that awaits the faithful man and woman. The faithful man and woman who place their responsibilities 
and their cares with God, the faithful man and woman who were diligent to show themselves approved by studying the word of God, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. The faithful man and woman who are free from their toils and obligations because those toils and obligations are no longer theirs because they have entered into the rest that has been prepared for them by God and they are living with God for eternity. Can you imagine the rest that awaits those who have died in the Lord? Blessed are those who die in the Lord. And as we come to a close in our lesson this morning, the question is simply this. Are there in our audience this morning those who are willing to accept the Savior's invitation? Are there those who are willing to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? For Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 24, Unless you believe that I am he, you will surely die in your sins. Are there those in our auditorium that are willing to repent of their past sins, to turn away from a life lived in sin because Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. Are there those in our auditorium this morning that are willing to confess the name of the Lord before men? For Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verses 32 and 33, He who confesses me before men, I too will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But he who denies me before men, I too will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. And are there those this morning that are willing to call upon the name of the Lord by being obedient to what God has commanded you to do? Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not a person saying the sinner's prayer or what a man told them to say. Paul says in Acts 22 and verse 16 that Ananias told him, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It means to be obedient to the gospel call of which is included being baptized so that you can have your sins remitted are there those who are willing to live a faithful life unto him that one day they can receive a crown of life revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 be faithful unto death and you shall receive the crown of life